Um, so I'd also like to thank Molly for inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, condensed meeting of amazing people, actually. And uh, it's very nice also to follow Amory. Um, so I'm going to talk, I think the things I'm going to talk about, actually, you know, might reflect some of the things that he was talking about from a theoretical point of view. And I'm basically going to show data or places where we can get data and which raise questions that maybe would fit with, with, with that theory. And it would be interesting to pursue that. Um, so, um, so I'm going to talk about Lake Malawi cichlids, which uh, are one of the most dramatic radiations um, in vertebrates. So you know, we heard about uh, maybe pulses of speciation, and uh, we know that there are evolutionary radi radiations that happen, um, <coughs> in which uh, arguably a, a large fraction of the creation of new species takes place. Um, and this is, this is a sort of textbook case of that. And uh, you know, this is a poster with, uh, can I do this? Yeah, I can. Um, uh, with examples of, um, of lots of different species, enormous variation in uh, morphology, actually in size. There are things you know, this big down to, to tiny little fish. Uh, in, in diet, uh, um, where they live, ecology, all sorts of, of traits. Um, and these have happened amongst haplochromine cichlids uh, in all the Great Lakes of East Africa. And in fact, there, there are cichlids in, across Africa, but particularly in the Great Lakes, there have been these radiations of hundreds of species. Um, or, uh, and in Lake Malawi, that's taken place within the last million years. We, we estimate probably within of the order of half a million years. So you know, this provides a great system in order to look at how things separate or become different and also how they maintain their differences because they're all sitting in the same lake. It's a big lake, um, but as we'll see, things are, are very accessible to each other. Okay, so we, we uh, people have worked on this system for a long time, um, but it's clear as genomic sequencing came along that we could now get it at the substrate, the genetic substrate of, of what's going on. And we started uh, a few years ago um, with Malan Malinsky, who's, who's here, uh, uh, and sequenced as a representative set of species, 72 species. Um, and there are a few of them illustrated here. And this is a, a neighbor joining tree of, of the genomes. Um, and the first message is that they're genetically very close. So they, here we see the distribution in gray of uh, um, diversity within species. It's about 0.1%, uh, so, or to 0.15%. That's you know, the same approximately as in humans, uh, relatively low for, for vertebrates. Um, but in the tan color, you see the divergence between pairs of species, the distribution of that. And that overlaps the diversity distribution and it, it, you know, is within a factor of two, uh, basically. Um, so uh, if we look at the tree, we have very long branches because actually that is reflecting, and in fact, there, there are multiple individuals of some species there reflecting the diversity. Um, and the FST between species varies at the bottom end, things that are called species. We can discuss what species, what should be called species, uh, uh, from 5% up to 65%. And that's comparable to what you see within single species, of some species like zebrafish. Um, so, so under a sort of uh, classical biological species concept, these all can, you can cross them with effort. They can produce fertile offspring. Um, uh, so they wouldn't be regarded as separate species. On the other hand, they are so different from each other and they clearly maintain their identities, their separation in, in the wild, in places where they can meet each other that you know, it's we can be interested in what's keeping them apart. And argue, you know, a key question, which we're going to come back to at the end, is are these in the process of separation from each other, or is this some sort of stable equilibrium where they're dynamically uh, in some relationship where they keep separate identities and population identities, but are still exchanging material? Um, I think those are, those are key questions. And of course, you know, what the it's behind that is that genetic separation is, is, is a gradual process. It takes time. So people want to think about speciation as a process going forward in time and somehow think that there's some 
you go from one species to two, and there has to be some event, some magic happens at some point. <laughs> but uh, uh, in reality, individuals are related by different de amounts, and that happens at differently at different loci along the genome. So there's a tree that relates things at a single point in the genome, but that tree within a population, of course, varies as you go along the genome. That's due to recombination. Um, and that, the depth of that is, I've put here, the order of a million years. It depends on the demography and the various other things. But actually, that's a good order of rule of thumb. And so you know, if, if things are separated by more than a million years, then you have gene trees within species, and they're well separated from each other. And so we have an overall species tree. If it's on the shorter term, you might still have, on average, species A being closer to species B. But just because of the depth of the separate individual gene trees, you can have uh, incomplete lineage sorting, where uh, this individual is actually closer to species C individuals than to species A individuals at that locus. And you can also have gene flow, where hybridization could still occur, and you can have gene flow after, in some sense, separation. And of course, there's a sort of blur between these two things. So there's a key question, how important is this process? And we just heard from uh, Amory, you know, there's theories about them facilitating and being very important in speciation. And there are multiple examples of those in cichlids, some of which I'm going to talk about, and there's others I'm not going to cover. So um, uh, if we look at the gene trees, we see in amongst our, our sequenced individuals, um, we built here separate trees for 1,500 regions with 5,000 variants each. Every single one is different from each other. They form a huge cloud like this. There's some sort of overall structure. Um, uh, so there is an average, and we can draw the average here in, in dark black for a subset of the species that represent the, these groups, which were identified a priori as, uh, as um, ecological uh, subtypes. And you know, the, the genera pretty much sought out in amongst these uh, these groups, the, the taxonomic genera. Um, but you can see there's a lot of variation even between those. And uh, the red tree here actually is the mitochondrial tree, um, which is very non-congruent to the average genomic tree. OK, so there's a sort of side point there. We can look at the average distance of each tree from the, the mean uh, nuclear tree. And there's a distribution. Uh, and the mitochondrial tree is, is, is an outlier in that. And, um, so from my perspective, at least when things are close, mitochondrial trees are not good ways of thinking about species relationships. And, uh, so that's all you know, about ILS, or at least that still could be accounted for by ILS. Do we see any evidence for, for uh, subsequent gene flow on top of that? So there's a very nice test that um, uh, Nick Patterson um, introduced in the context of looking at uh, human population relationships. Um, these are D statistics, or there's a set of F tests. So the F4 test is, corresponds to this. And essentially, what you did is look at a case where you have um, a pair of species or populations which you think are, uh, are sisters or are closely related. And uh, you've got an out group, and then you've got a more distant um, uh, population, and you're asking, is one of these ones which should be, uh, which you think of as being um, a s sort of symmetric sister, actually more closely related to, to this one here, this sort of test group? And the archetypical example for this is in humans, for looking at thinking about Europeans and Africans as modern humans, uh, for, or out of, Asia, out of Africa in population, and Neanderthals, uh, uh, and say, Chimp as an outgroup. And then um, what the test does is it looks at uh, Variants which uh, differ between the the outgroup and the um, uh, and the sort of test uh, species or population, and which are polymorphic also between the two uh, in groups, and if you for those variants which which fit this pattern, there's two ways around they could be. They could either be A B B A or B A B A. So this is sometimes called the Abba Baba test. Okay. Uh, and, um, and assuming there was no flow here, this should be symmetric. The numbers you see of both of those should be the same. And uh, 
um, since these are variants which happened at least as far ago as here, uh, this actually is independent of, of uh, changes in branch length and uh, quite a lot of de demographic assumptions as well. So, it's, um, so the test is essentially just to c take the difference between these two and uh, stand and normalize it. Um, and in this case, you get a significant result that's, that's strongly significant because there are a lot of such variants across the genome. So even small effects can be significant. Okay, so what do, happens if we do this for, for Lake Malawi, where we use as an outgroup a uh, um, Tanyanika cichlid, I think. Um, oops. Uh, well, we get, so this is the Z score, and this is the admixture ratio, which under certain assumptions, which don't always hold, and actually one should take with a grain of salt, but to sort of a, a first stab at the actual fraction of admixture, uh, um, the, the, the fraction of admixture. What we see is this huge slew of very strongly significant results, um, including at quite significant uh, admixture ratios. So, you know, un under a pure ILS model, uh, this would you, you would essentially have have none of this. So it's clear that there's been a lot of things which either come from population structure or from gene flow, and. Um, uh, that happens both within groups. These are within in-group distributions. There's substantial amounts of significant uh, uh, flow, and also between groups. Okay. Um, so you know, there's further sort of evidence for this sort of thing. That in fact, we can we can start looking. And I should say, you might say, oh well, it's all a gamish. You know, it's all a mess, and everything is mixed up. That's actually not true. There is an overall phylogeny, and in fact, the groups. Who uh, are consistent by many average measures. Um, so, uh, if we look at PCA plots, uh, so specific, probably the sort of oldest, strongest signal comes from um, looking at this group of, of species here, which are the most close relatives. Uh, so, this is the sort of first split in the tree, and then uh, this splits from these groups. But there's this um, spread here, a uh, Klein in this direction. These are deep water specialists, um, open deep water fish. And these are benthic, they sit on the bottom of the, uh, of the lake, but they're sort of shallow and deep versions. And the deep versions are, are, are you know, in the direction of the, uh, of the deep water uh, diplotaxodon. And um, we can in fact see that, that very kind of clear directional spread here. Uh, and if we look at Variants which have excess non synonymous divergence across the lake, and we look for things in the in the top percentage there, and there's a significant number which have actually a positive, have more non synonymous than synonymous variants. Uh, the significant number of genes. So this is this is a, a histogram over genes. Um, there's enrichment in a set of uh, uh, functionalities which we know are associated with with water depth in fish, particularly the vision visual system and the uh, um, oxygen transport, globins, and so on. And in those, we find that the, the deep water um, benthics, which are phylogenetically distant from diplotaxodon, but ecologically, live in similar environments, uh, actually share the same um, haplotypes in uh, uh, both. This is, a, this is a, a visual processing gene, and there are also actually opsins uh, that show this pattern. So. Um, it looks as though there has been potentially selection on gene flow that's allowed traits to move. Okay, so uh, yes, that's just a so so that's all on a sort of big scale. Can we actually see this in action? What's going on on a fine scale? So this is a study um, with uh, uh, George Turner and Martin Jenner, who we've done a lot of the sample collection uh, at one lo location in. Um, uh, Chilumba, which is in the north of the lake, so it's a large lake. It's like a you know, 700 kilometers long. There's, there is space for lots of things to happen, but at this location, there's a set of reefs um, and small islands and reefs uh, offshore, which are separated by several kilometers from each other. And these fish, these imbuna-type fish, live in rocky reefs, and really, that's they're specialists. That's where they live. They don't uh, venture out that far, and you get a lot of local specialization. And um, so, uh, but 
There's this type of fish here, Melandia zebra. Many people, this is a sort of standard Malawi cichlid that people who have fish tanks and uh, may have examples of. Um, but there are different morphs and forms of that uh, in this uh, area. And in particular, these ones, these Amiltos ones that have a red uh, streak on the, the dorsal fin and find zilberry, and you find both of those types at uh, all of these locations. And so we can, we can study relationships between those species and see whether, whether they're really sepa staying separated. So we, we, we do see these together. And in fact, you can see um, in mating preference studies, which I'm not going to show you, that there is mating preference of the females to the, their parental, uh, their, their species type. Um, OK, so we took about 200 fish from this system. And uh, this is an overall tree. It's, you can't see it all. It's too detailed. Um, and I guess the simplest assumption might have been that this is the derived form, because this looks more like this. But actually, it's more complicated than that, as things tend to be. Um, and um, what seems to happen is that the, the fine zilberry from three different locations sit nested within the Amiltos uh, uh, species. So these are actually all closer to one of the locations of the um, Amiltos than, than that whole group is to the other one. Uh, so, um, so if we look at a, at a PCA plot of the, all these samples, uh, this is kind of reflecting that. So this is PC1 and PC2, about 4% and 2% of the variance. Uh, this is the, the outgroup one uh, separated out on PC1. Uh, these are the three fine zilberries and uh, the, the um, um, Luina Reef one. Emiltos is a bit in this direction, so it has some Emiltos-like qualities, um, but is, you know, is clearly closer to all of these. And in uh, PC2 and PC3, very nicely separate out everything except for the, the Emiltos uh, uh, umfanga, the M version, which sits in the middle. So these are the three fine silveries. But if you look at them, there are outliers in each of those collections. So this was a collection of what appeared phenotypically all the same from one place. And here, there's pairs of outliers, uh, which might reflect that there's some sort of uh, gene flow going on, and these are some type of um, hybrid or uh, not fully resolved hybrid. Um, so if we look at those more closely, this is an admixture plot, as Jonathan introduced. Uh, uh, these are the different groups. But you can see that there are these uh, single, you know, odd individ occasional individuals who look a bit different. And interestingly, after we observed this and we went back and looked at this, the, this pair of um, fish here in this group that looked different, which are, are actually these, these two here, uh, um, which belong to that group. Uh, so phenotypically, you can see slight differences. So the two differences that, um, so these have lost their color because they're, they're formaldehyde fixed. But uh, this dorsal dark stripe is, is shorter here than is typical for, the, for this species, it runs further along the dorsal fin. And also, these fish are all a little bit deeper in body shape, and these are a bit narrower. So there's, you know, it does appear that there's, a, that there's some variation there in this population towards possibly other species. Um, hmm, OK, whoops, wrong, wrong direction. And there's some evidence also in this system for weak local gene flow between species, so that the fine zilberry in Luino Reef are closer to the Amiltos and Luino Reef than uh, the other fine zilberry are. Uh, and there's a d-test here that's significant. It has a z-score of about four and a half or five. OK, so, so there is some evidence. And actually, it's quite a few. You know, We have tens of individuals. And if there's really hybrids at this level of a few, how are they keeping themselves separate is a question. And this is actually quite a, it's a rich system. It's interesting to pursue what's going on, but we don't know. It's in the open lake. We don't know really everything else. We haven't got samples of everything that's there, so it's hard to follow. So actually, we, I'm going to finish off with, um, by looking at going back to a system that we started in, which is a kind of model system for the whole of Lake Malawi. It's a crater lake uh, uh, um, Masoko, which is just north of Malawi. And there, uh, it's about 800 meters across, much smaller. Um, it's a volcanic crater lake. There's a series of them, as you can see in this picture. Uh, there's a couple of pictures here. 
Um, there are actually, I think, three species of fish there, but one of them has separated out, apparently, or there's, there's two morphs. Uh, so these are a, a yellow morph, which is like this sort of standard generalist uh, Acetotelopia calyptera, uh, and then there's a, there's a morph which appears deeper, which is a bit different in body shape and various other characteristics, and uh, uh, it's blue, uh, when in the males are colored blue, and, um, oops, uh, and it looks like on a tree of all these species, this lake is, forms one clade. Um, there's, the blues are kind of nested within that as a, as a group. Okay. Uh, so, um, so we've actually been collecting more fish from this lake and phenotyping them uh, and characterizing them in more detail. Uh, than in the original paper. And so Hannah Munby uh, has been processing that data. He's a, a master's student. Um, and here's a PCA of this system. And the, the first PC has about 2.5% of the variance, so significantly more than the second one. And what we see is on the PCA, so we've, we're coloring samples here by three colors, but where they were caught, shallow, intermediate, or deep. And firstly, we see this strong cluster um, of fish, all of whom were caught deep. Uh, and they effectively look like a sort of separate population. And then what we see is this other type, which is the more like the generalist fish um, that one finds in all neighboring lakes and rivers. Uh, there's a main cluster here. And some of these are caught at different depths, including intermediate depths and a handful at, at deep depths. So it looks like these do venture down occasionally and, uh, and come back. And then, you know, there's a smear of stuff in between, um, which includes fish, which progressively, as you go leftwards, are found deep, but uh, are not, um, uh, but still, you know, are found at mixed depths. So it looks like potentially we've got a situation where there's some specialized, there's a general form that prefers shallow but is can sort of venture. And uh, there's, a, there's a specific specialized set who never venture out of the, uh, the, the shallow, uh, out of the deep water. So this is from Milan's original paper. Um, if you do an FST scan across the genome, one sees these islands that, uh, that uh, Amory was talking about. Uh, the overall FST is about 4%. Uh, you see clusters of highly differentiated regions. Nothing is fixed different. Maybe that's consistent with there being some hybridization. Um, uh, this is a sort of control. It's a comparison to another lake. Um, and there's, there's really nothing significant in that comparison. Uh, so there's about 50 to 100. It depends how you, how you define them. Uh, you can do GoTem analysis. And also, you find things involved in vision there and various other things that I'm going to rush through. Um, these do look a separate group. If you look at body shape, here's a, a, a plot of uh, body shape, the first principal component of body shape against genotype. And this cluster here is, is different in that respect. Um, uh, and so we started you know, trying to find loci involved in that process. But what I actually want to talk to you about, which I think might help us understand what's going on, is this uh, recent study by Julia Troutsey with Martin Jenner where they've started looking at the at scales, um, a specific set of large scales along the uh, lateral side of the, the fish. And you can count these rings and use them as a proxy for age. Now, they're not years, because uh, these fish are not living as long as there are rings. Um, but we're working on the basis that we can use those as shared uh, uh, proxies for, for essentially growth rate by uh, standardizing the number of the count of rings to the, the, the length of the fish. And when we do that, um, if we take the genotype, PC1, oops, uh, we see that the, the, the growth rate, standard length over age, um, has this you know, pronounced U-shaped uh, shape, suggesting that there's, um, uh, there's a fitness deficit in the in the uh, intermediate genotype. Um, and we can fit a quadratic selection coefficient to that, or Martin has, uh, comes to 0.8, which is um, as seen in, this is a classic review of, of these coefficients, and they're all typically around 0.1 or low value. So this is right at the extreme 
a very, looks at very strong uh, measure. So, um, and furthermore, you might say, well, maybe it's, this is just where they're caught, that, 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 that the, uh, um, the, the genotype, the intermediate genotype ones tend to be caught at the intermediate depth, and maybe that's a bad place to live compared to, you know, not, not so it's reflecting that. But as we saw, actually, in the original plot here, uh, the, the separation isn't complete by, by depth, certainly in this group, and um, we can actually consider the mean of that, uh, oops, as a function of, of depth on this axis or genotype on this axis, it's very clear that the dip is much stronger as a function of genotype than it is as a function of depth of, of being caught. Now, of course, this is, we don't know that they spent their whole life at that depth. This is where they were caught. So there are caveats involved, uh, but the suggestion is that maybe they are hybridizing um, in this case, uh, and maybe they're hybridizing and then there's preferential hybridization back to the generalists because, um, and which is why you get things in the middle here and in this direction, but there's actually sort of a gap between them and, and here. Um, and, uh, uh, but there is, there is selection against this. So there's a selection system against this, but it's a system that's leaky and allowing things through. So I'm gonna finish there. Um, I, I think it's a very, you know, there's a really rich system here. And one thing I actually I want to do from my experience in human genetics where uh, there's been this tremendous effect of people generating large data sets and then other people being able to being available for people to use. So all the things that Jonathan and uh, Guy talked about have been, you know, based on these big resources. And I, uh, I, so we've now actually got 2,500 fish uh, sequenced, 15x. And so I'm hoping... Um, uh, you know, with at least some initial publication of that to get that out there so that all the theoreticians in this audience who have all these great ideas can, can look and maybe extract more about what's going on in this system. But I think a key question is how do these things stay separate? I mean, you might think the first question is how do they separate? There is some ecological, it's not all in sympatry, there is some sort of allopatric quality about this, this situation. But it seems like there is gene flow in quite a lot of it, and we've seen that a lot, and so how do you things keep separate, we, we have this fitness you know, um, suggestion. I mean, this is a picture here, actually, of them in the wild, and it's proof it's not a fish tank. There's a, there's a hippo in the picture. Uh, <laughs> um, luckily, I've never seen a hippo in the, <laughs> while I've been in the water there. Uh, but uh, so, so, so are we seeing a transitional state you know, towards full separation? Is this a process of speciation, or is it a stable equilibrium? Is this, is this the sort of, do we get this huge variety of cichlids because they manage to keep themselves to, to do this business of separating out uh, 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 key loci that are involved in the face of gene flow, um, and was this be, is the initial separation due to some sort of sympatric sorting of, out of these properties, or does it require there to be gene flow in to, to kind of kick things into a new uh, a new uh, type, which then can establish an equilibrium. So I, th I think there's a whole set of questions like that. Um, and I want to finish there, and I want to thank Milan, who uh, was now a, a postdoc with Walter Salzberger, uh, Hannes Svardal, who uh, as postdoc has now got a job at Antwerp, and Margarita and Tyler and Hannah, still in the group working on the cichlids and other people working on other things. But in particular, it's important to thank uh, the collaborators who really have worked for a long time in these systems, so George Turner, uh, and colleagues at Bangor and Martin Jenner and colleagues at Bristol. Uh, and the group who actually got me into all this was Eric Miska at uh, Gurdon Institute and Amelia, who now has a lab in zoology. So thanks.